Hello, this is the next instalment of Edith Nisbet's The Phoenix and the Carpet. And we're now up to chapter eight. The Cats, the Cow and the Burglar. The nursery was full of Persian cats and muskrats that had been brought there by the wishing carpet. The cats were mewing and the muskrats were squeaking so that you could hardly hear yourself speak. In the kitchen were the four children, one candle, a concealed phoenix and a very visible policeman. Now then, look here, said the policeman very loudly, and he pointed his lantern at each child in turn. What's the meaning of this here yelling and the cat a wailing? I'll tell you, you've got a cat here and someone's a ill treating of it. What do you mean by a... It was five to one, counting the phoenix, but the policeman, who was one, was of unusually fine size, and the five, including the phoenix, were small. The mews and the squeaks grew softer, and in the comparative silence, Cyril said, It's true, there are a few cats here, but we've not hurt them. It's quite the opposite, we've just fed them. It don't sound like it, said the policeman grimly. I dare say they're not real cats, said Jane madly. Perhaps they're only dream cats. Oh, dream cat you, my lady, was the brief response of the force. If you understood anything except people who do murders and stealings and naughty things like that, I'd tell you all about it, said Robert. But I'm certain you don't. You're not meant to shove your oar into people's private cat keepings. You're only supposed to interfere when people shout murder and stop thief in the street. So there. The policeman assured them that he should see about that. And at this point, the phoenix, who had been making itself small on the pot shelf under the dresser, among the saucepan lids and the fish kettle, walked on tiptoed claws in a noiseless and modest manner and left the room unnoticed by anyone. Oh, don't be so horrid, Anthea was saying gently and earnestly. We love cats, dear puffy soft things. We wouldn't hurt them for worlds, would we, puffy? And Jane answered that of course they wouldn't, and still the policeman seemed unmoved by their eloquence. Now look here, he said. Oh, I'm going to see what's in that room beyond there. And his voice was drowned in a wild burst of mewing and squeaking. And as soon as it died down, all four children began to explain at once. And though the squeaking and mewing were not at their very loudest, yet there were enough of both to make it very hard for the policeman to understand a single word any of the four wholly different explanations now poured out to him. Stow it, he said at last. I'm going into the next room in the execution of my duty. I'm going to use my eyes and my ears have gone off their chumps. What with you and them cats? And he pushed Robert aside and strode through the door. Don't say I didn't warn you, said Robert. It's tigers, really, said Jane. Father said so. I wouldn't go in if I were you. But the policeman was quite stony. Nothing anyone seem, said seemed to make any difference to him. Some policemen are like this, I believe. He strode down the passage in another moment he would have been in the room with all the cats and the rats, Musk. But at the very instant a thin, sharp voice screamed from the street outside. Murder! Murder! Stop thief! The policeman stopped with one regulation boot heavily poised in the air. Aye, he said. And again the shrieks sounded shrilly and piercingly from the dark street outside. Come on, said Robert, come and look after cats while somebody's being killed outside. For Robert had an inside feeling that told him quite plainly who it was that was screaming. You young rip, said the policeman, I'll settle you up with you, Bimidi. And he rushed out. And the children heard his boots going weightily along the pavement and the screams also going along rather ahead of the policeman. And both the murder screams and the policeman's boots faded away in the remote distance. Then Robert smacked his knickerbocker loudly with his palm and said, Good old Phoenix, I should know its golden voice anywhere. 
and then everyone understood how cleverly the phoenix had caught uh, ro what Robert had said about the real work of the policeman being to look after murderers and thieves and not after cats, and all hearts were filled with admiring affection. But he'll come back, said Anthea mournfully, as soon as he f as it finds the murderer is only a bright vision of a dream and there isn't one at all, really. No, he won't, said the soft voice of the clever phoenix as it flew in. He does not know where your house is. I heard him own as much to a fellow mercenary. Oh, what a night we are having! Lock the door and let us rid ourselves of this intolerable smell of the perfume peculiar to the muskrat and to the house of the trimmers of beards. If you'll excuse me, I will go to bed. I am worn out. <coughs> it was Cyril who wrote the paper that told the carpet to take away the rats and bring milk because there seemed to be no doubt in any breast that, however Persian cats m may be, they must like milk. <coughs> Let's hope it won't be musk milk, said Anthea in gloom, as she pinned the paper face downwards on the carpet. Is there such a thing as a musk cow? she added anxiously, as the carpet shriveled and vanished. I do hope not. Perhaps really it would have been wiser to let the carpet take the cats away. It's getting quite late and we can't keep them here all night. Oh, can't we? was the bitter rejoinder of Robert, who had been fastening the side door. You might have consulted me, he went on. I'm not such an idiot as some people think. Why, whatever? Don't you see, we've jolly well got to keep the cats all night. Oh, get down, you furry beasts. Because we've had three wishes out of the old carpet now and we can't get any more till tomorrow. The liveliness of Persian Muse alone prevented the occurrence of a dismal silence. Anthea spoke first. Never mind, she said. Do you know, I really do think they're quieting down a bit. Perhaps they heard the fey milk. They can't understand English, said Jane. You forget their Persian cat's panther. Well, said Anthea rather sharply, for she was tired and anxious. Who told you milk wasn't Persian for milk? Lots of English words are just the same as French. At least I know meow is, and croquet, and fiancé. Oh, pussies, do be quiet. Let's stroke them as hard as we can with both hands, and perhaps they'll stop. So everyone stroked grey fur till their hands were tired, and as soon as a cat had been stroked enough to make it stop mewing, it was pushed gently away, and another mewing mouser was approached by the hands of the strokers. And the noise was really more than half purr, when the carpet suddenly appeared in its proper place, and on it, instead of rows of milk cans or even of milk jugs, there was a cow. Not a Persian cow, either nor, most fortunately, a musk cow, if there is such a thing, but a smooth, sleek, dun-coloured Jersey cow who blinked large, soft eyes at the gaslight and mooed in an amiable, if rather inquiring, manner. Anthea, who had always been afraid of cows, but now she tried to be brave. Anyway, it can't run after me, she said to herself. There isn't room for it even to begin to run. The cow was perfectly placid. She behaved like a strayed duchess till someone bought a saucer for the milk and someone tr else tried to milk the cow into it. Milking is very difficult. You may think it is easy, but it is not. All the children were by this time strung up to a pitch of heroism that would have been impossible to them in their ordinary condition. Robert and Cyril held the cow by the horns and Jane, when she was quite sure that their end of the cow was quite secure, consented to stand by ready to hold the cow by the tail should occasion arise. Anthea holding the saucer now advanced towards the cow. She remembered to have heard that cows when milked by strangers are susceptible to the soothing influence of the human voice. So clutching her saucer very tight she sought for words to whose soothing influence the cow might be susceptible and her memory troubled by the events of the night which seemed to go on and on for ever and ever refused to help her with any form of words suitable to address a Jersey cow in. Poor Puffy then, lie down then, 
Good dog, lie down, was all that she could think of to say. And she said it. Ed and nobly laughed. The situation full of grey mewing cats was far too serious for that. Then Anthea, with a beating heart, tried to milk the cow. Next moment the cow had knocked the saucer out of her hand, trampled on it with one foot whilst the other three. She had walked on a foot each of Robert, Cyril and Jane. Jane burst into tears. Oh, how hor much too horrid everything is, she cried. Come away, let's go to bed and leave the horrid cats with the hateful cow. Perhaps somebody will eat somebody else and serve them right. They did not go to bed, but they had had a shivering council in the drawing room which smelt of soot and indeed a heap of this lay in the fender there had been no fire in the room since mother went away and all the chairs and tables were in the wrong places and the chrysanthemums were dead and the water in the pot nearly dried up anthea wrapped the embroidered woolly sofa blanket round jane and herself while robert and cyril had a struggle silent and brief but fierce for the larger share of the fur hearthrug it is most truly awful, said Anthea, and I am so tired. Let's let the cat loose. And the cow, perhaps, said Cyril. The police would find us at once. That cow would stand at the gate and mew, I, I, I mean moo, to come in. And so would the cats. No, I see quite well what we've got to do. We must put them in baskets and leave them on people's doorsteps like orphan foundlings. We have got three baskets counting mother's work one, said Jane, brightening. And there are nearly two hundred cats, said Anthea, besides the cow, and it would have have to be a different sized basket for her, and then I don't know how you'd carry it, and you'd never find a doorstep big enough to put it on, except the church one, and, and Oh well, said Cyril, if you simply make difficulties I'm with you, said Robert. Don't fuss about the cow, Panther. It's simply got to stay the night. And I'm sure I've read that the cow is a remunerating creature, and that means it will sit still and think for hours. The carpet can take it away in the morning, and as for the baskets, we'll do them up in dusters or, or pillowcases or bath towels. Come on, Squirrel, you girls can be out of it if you like. His tone was full of contempt, but Jane and Anthea were too tired and desperate to care even being out of it, which at other times they could not have borne now seemed quite a comfort. They snuggled down in the sofa blanket, and Cyril threw the fur hearthrug over them. Ah, oh, he said, that's all women are fit for, to keep safe and warm while the men do the work and run dangers and risks and things. I'm not, said Anthea, you know I'm not, but Cyril was gone. It was warm under the blanket and hearthrug, and Jane snuggled up close to her sister, and Anthea cuddled Jane closely and kindly, and in a sort of dream they heard the rise of a wave of mewing as Robert opened the door of the nursery. They heard the booted search for baskets in the back kitchen. They heard the side door open and close, and they knew that each brother had gone out with at least one cat. Anthea's last thought was that it would take at least all night to get rid of 199 cats by twos. There would be 99 journeys of two cats each and one cat over. I almost think we might keep the one cat over, said Anthea. I don't seem to care for cats just now, but I dare say I shall again some day. And she fell asleep. Jane also was sleeping. It was Jane who awoke with a start to find Anthea still asleep. As in the act of awakening, she kicked her sister. She wondered idly why they should have gone to bed in their boots, but the next moment she remembered where they were. There was a sound of muffled, shuffled feet on the stairs. Like the heroine of a classic poem, Jane thought it was the boys, and she felt wide, quite wide awake and not nearly so tired as before. She crept gently from Anthea's side and followed the footsteps. They went down into the basement. The cats, who seemed to have fallen into the sleep of exhaustion, awoke at the sound of the approaching footsteps and mewed piteously. Jane was at the foot of the stairs before she saw that it was not her brothers whose coming had aroused her and the cats, but a burglar. She knew he was a burglar at once because he wore a fur cap and a red and black charity check comforter and he had no business where he was. 
If you had been stood in Jane's shoes, you would no doubt have run away in them, appealing to the police and the neighbours with horrid screams. But Jane knew better. She had read a great many nice stories about burglars, as well as some affecting pieces of poetry. And she knew that no burglar will ever hurt a little girl if he meets her when burgling. Indeed, in all the cases Jane had read of, his burglarishness was almost at once forgotten in the interest he felt in the little girl's artless prattle. So, if Jane hesitated for a moment before addressing the burglar, it was only because she could not at once think of any remarks sufficiently prattling and artless to make a beginning with. In the stories and the affecting poetry, the child could never speak plainly, though it always looked old enough to in the pictures, and Jane could not make up her mind to lisp and talk baby even to a burglar. And while she hesitated, he softly opened the nursery door and went in. Jane followed. Just in time to see him sit down flat on the floor, scattering cats as a stone thrown into a pool splashes water. She closed the door softly and stood there, still wondering whether she could bring herself to say, What's O doing here, Mr Wobber? And whether any other kind of talk would do. Then she heard the burglar drawing a long breath, and he spoke. It's a judgment, he said. So help me, Bob, if it ain't. Oh, here's a thing that happened to a chap. Make it, makes it home, oh, you done it, neither. Cats and cats and cats. There couldn't be all them cats, let alone the cow, if she ain't the more of the old man's daisy. She's a dream out of when I was a lad, I don't mind her so much. Here, daisy, daisy. The cow turned and looked at him. She's all right, he went on. Sort of company too. Though them above know how she got into the downstairs parlour. But them cats, oh, take them away, take them away, I'll chuck the old show. Oh, take them away. Burglar, said Jane close behind him, and he started convulsively and turned on her, a blank face whose pale lips trembled. I can't take those cats away. Lula me, exclaimed the man, if here ain't another one of them. Are oh, you real, miss, or something I'll wake up from presently? I'm quite real, said Jane, relieved to find that a lisp was not needed to make the burglar understand her. And so, she added, are the cats. Then send for the police, send for the police, and I'll go quiet. If you ain't no realer than them cats, I'm done, spachunk, out of time. Send for the police, I'll go quiet. One thing, there'd be not be room for half them cats in those cellars ever I see. He ran his fingers through his hair, which was short, and his eyes wandered wildly round the room full of cats. Burglar, said Jane kindly and softly, if you didn't like cats, what did you come here for? Send for the police, was the unfortunate criminal's only reply. I'd rather you would, honest, I'd rather... I daren't, said Jane, and besides, I've no one to send. I hate the police. I wish he'd never been born. You've a feeling of heart, miss, said the burglar, for them cats is really a little bit too thick. Look here, said Jane, I won't call the police, and I am quite a real little girl, though I talk older than the kind you've met before when you've been doing your burglings. And they are real cats, and they want real milk. And didn't you say the cow was like somebody's daisy that you used to know? Wish I may die if she ain't the very spit of her, replied the man. Well then, said Jane, and a thrill of joyful pride ran through her. Perhaps you know how to milk cows. Perhaps I does, was the burglar's cautious rejoinder. Then, said Jane, if you will only milk ours, you don't know how we shall always love you. The burglar replied that loving was all very well. If those cats only had a good, long, wet, thirsty drink of milk, Jane went on with eager persuasion, they'd lie down and go to sleep as likely as not, and then the police won't come back. But if they go on mewing like this, he will. Then I don't know what'll become of us, or you, either. This argument seemed to decide the criminal. J 
Jane fetched the wash bowl from the sink and he spat on his hands and prepared to milk the cow. At this instant, boots were heard on the stairs. It's all up, said the man desperately. This here's a plant, here's the police. He made as if to open the window and leap from it. It's all right, I tell you, whispered Jane in anguish. I'll say you're a friend of mine or the good clergyman called in or my uncle or, or anything. Only do, do, do milk the cow. Only don't go. Oh, oh, thank goodness, it's only the boys. It was, and their entrance had awakened Anthea, who, with her brothers, now crowded through the doorway. The man looked about him like a rat looks round a trap. This is a friend of mine, said Jane. He's just called in and he's going to milk the cow for us. Isn't it good and kind of him? She winked at the others and though they did not understand, they played up loyally. How do, said Cyril. Very glad to meet you. Don't let us interrupt the milking. I shall have an head in the morning and a half in... Oh, I shall have an head and a half in the morning and no blooming error, remarked the burglar. But he began to milk the cow. Robert was winked at to stay and see that he did not leave off milking the cow or try to escape, and the others went to get things to put the milk in, for it was now spurting and foaming in the wash bowl, and the cats had ceased from mewing and were crowded round the cow with the expressions of hope and anticipation on their whiskered faces. We can't get rid of any more cats, said Cyril, as he and his sisters piled a tray high with saucers and soup plates and platters and pie dishes. The police very nearly got us as it was. Not the same one, a much stronger sort. He thought it really was a foundling orphan we had got. If it hadn't been for me throwing the two bags of cats slapping his eye and hauling Robert over a railing and lying like mice under a laurel bush, well, it's jolly lucky I'm a good shot, that's all. He pranced off when he got the cat bags off his face, thought we'd bolted, and here we are. The gentle sameishness of the milk swishing into the handbowl seemed to have soothed the burglar very much. He went on milking in a sort of happy dream, while the children got a cup and ladled warm milk out onto the pie dishes and plates and platters and saucers and set them down to the music of Persian purrs and lappings. It makes me think of old times, said the burglar, smearing his ragged coat cuff across his eyes. About the apples in the orchards at home. And the rats at fresh in time, and the rabbits and the ferrets, and how pretty it was seeing the pigs killed. Finding him in this softened mood, Jane said, I wish you'd tell us how you came to choose our house for your burglaring tonight. I'm awfully glad you did. You have been so kind. I don't know what we should have done without you, she added hastily. We all love you ever so. Do tell us. The others added their affectionate entreaties, and at last the burglar said, Well, it's my first job, and I didn't expect it to be made so welcome. And that's the truth, young ladies and gents. And I don't know what, but what it won't be my last. For this here cow, she reminds me of my father, and I know how he divided me if I'd laid the hands on a penny as wasn't my own. I'm sure he would, Jane agreed kindly. But what made you come here? Well, miss, said the burglar, you know best how you come by them cats and why you don't like the police. So I'll give myself away free and trust to your noble arts. You'd best bail out a bit, the pan's getting foolish. I was a selling oranges off me barra. For I ain't a burglar by trade, though you have used the name Sir Free. And there was a lady bought three pennyworth worth off me. And while she was a-picking of her mat, very careful indeed, and I'm always glad when them sort gets a few over-ripe ones, there was two other ladies talking over the fence. And one of them said to the other on them, just like this, I've told both girls to come and they can doss in with Maria and Jane, cause their boss and his missus is miles away and the kids too, so they can just lock up the ass and leave the gas a burning, so no one won't know and get back bright and early by eleven o'clock 
and we'll make a night of it, Mrs. Prosser. So we will. I'm just a going to run out and pop the letter in the post. And then the lady what had chosen the free ape of worth so careful, she said, No, Mrs. Wigson, I wonder at you and your hands all over suds. This good gentleman has slip it to the post for you. I'll be bound, seeing I'm a customer of his. So they gave me the letter. And of course I read the direction what was written on it afore I shoved it into the post. And then when I'd sold my barrel full, I was a going home with the chink in my pocket. And I'm blowed if some blooming thieving beggar didn't nick the lot. Whilst I was just a wetting of me whistle for calling of oranges is dry work. Nick the blooming lot he did, and me with not a farthen a come home and my brother and his missus. How awful, said Anthea with much sympathy. Awful indeed, miss, I believe you, the burglar rejoined with deep feeling. You don't know her temper when she's razzed, and I'm sure I hope you never may neither. And I'd add all me oranges off em. So it came back to me what was wrote on the en envelope, and I says to myself, why not seeing as I've been done myself, and if they keeps two slaves there, there must be some pittings, and so here I am. But them cats there brought me back to the ways of honestness, never no more. Look here, said Cyril. These cats are very valuable, very indeed, and we will give them all to you, if only you will take them away. I see they're a breedy lot, replied the burglar, but I don't want no bother with the coppers. Did you come by them honest now, straight? They're all our very own, said Anthea. We wanted them, but the confinement, consignment, whispered Cyril, was larger than we wanted, and they're an awful bother. If you've got your barrow and some thacks or baskets, your brother's missus would be awfully pleased. My father says Persian cats are worth pounds and pounds for each. Well, says the burglar, and he was certainly moved by her marks, I'll see you in an hole, and I don't mind lending a helping hand. I oh, don't ask how you came by em, but I've got a Pow, he's a mark on cats. I'll fetch him along, and if he thinks they'll fetch anything above their skins, I oh, don't mind doing you a kindness. But you won't go away and never come back, said Jane, because I don't think I could bear that. The burglar, quite touched by her emotion, swore sentimentally that, alive or dead, he would come back. Then he went, and Cyril and Robert sent the girls to bed and set up to wait for his return. It soon seemed absurd to wait him in a state of wakefulness, but his stealthy tap on the window awoke them readily enough. For he did return with the pal and the barrow and the sacks. The pal approved of the cats now dormant in Persian repletion, and they were bundled into the sacks and taken away on the barrow, mewing indeed, but with mews too sleepy to attract public attention. I'm a fence, that's what I am, said the burglar gloomily. I never thought I'd come down to this, and all because me kind art. Cyril knew that a fence is a receiver of stolen goods, and he replied briskly, I give you my sacred, the cats aren't stolen. What did you make the time? I ain't got a time on me, said the pal. But I was just about chucking out time as I came by the bull and gate. I shouldn't wonder if it was nigh on upon one there. When the cats had been removed and the boys and the burglar had parted with warm expressions of friendship, there remained only the cow. She must stay all night, said Robert. Cook will have a fit when she sees her. All night, said Cyril. Why, it's tomorrow morning if it's one. We can have another wish. So the carpet was urged in a hastily written note to remove the cow to wherever she belonged and to return to its proper place on the nursery floor. But the cow could not be got to move on to the carpet. Sir Robert got the clothesline out of the back kitchen and tied one end very firmly to the cow's horns and the other end to a bunched up corner of the carpet and said, Fire away! 
and the carpet and cow vanished together, and the boys went to bed tired out and only too thankful that the evening at last was over. Next morning the carpet lay calmly in its place, but one corner was very badly torn. It was the corner that the cow had been tied on to.